Well, hello and welcome to Wesley Wednesday. We're so happy that you've joined us today. My name is Lisa Osterlo and I represent our Wesley community at the Dahali campus in Bonnie Lake. A lot of you have connections to all of our different campuses. Some of you are from out of town and some from even out of state. Some of you have a long history with Wesley and some may be joining us for the first time today. For those new to Wesley, let me share a little bit about who we are. Wesley is a not-for-profit retirement community that started 76 years ago. Um, we have continued to grow in our service with campuses now in Des Moines, Auburn, Lee Hill, Puyallup, Bradley Park, and to Holly and Bonnie Lake. We have continued to be different through community choice and continuing care. Um, I'm gonna introduce Joan with our Bradley Park campus. So go ahead, Joan. Okay, great, thank you. I'm Joan Engel and I am the community relation director here at Bradley Park in Puyallup. And um, the one thing about our campuses is they are very energetic and lively. Um, we have very active residents, uh, fun field activities, um, and including the one thing that we're really proud of is our Wesley University uh, continuing education um, learning that we're able to provide. Um, and residents here on our campuses have a voice in what we do and what they want to do. So we have um, a resident board, we have a council, they are engaged in programs with our wood shop. Uh, Bradley Park, we even have a yacht club where they have uh, yachts that they bring over to the lake and sail around. Um, creativity center, exercise classes, choir, you name it, we have a little bit of everything here. Um, and on our campuses here at Wesley, we have several different living options. So we have independent um, options. We have um, assisted type living, memory care. We even have Wesley Home and Health Care. And um, that's all a part of what we offer to help you su be supported in your home, which would be hopefully Wesley. Um, go ahead, Lisa. Okay. Um, the Wesley at Holly campus in Bonnie Lake is our newest Wesley community. Uh, the Brownstone Apartments just opened in December. We have residents living on the campus now. Um, the lodge is still under construction and is scheduled to open in June. The campus is amazing with lots of walking trails, parks, and huge spacious community areas. The apartments are large with big windows, um, letting the natural light in. We talk about letting the outdoors in. Um, and you can call me to find out more about this opportunity at Wesley at Tahale. We're actually, we're currently taking, actively taking reservations for all of our independent apartments as well. And there we go. Um, our Lee Hill campus in Auburn, it's with, it has 19 acres and it opened in 2007 and is home to over 200 families. Wesley Lee Hill offers all levels from independent living, catered living in the commons, memory care, and it also includes a 36 bed skilled nursing and rehabilitation center with all private suites. Uh, so if you'd like to learn about more about Lee Hill, you can go online or give us a call there as well. And I am at Bradley Park. So I am in the beautiful Wesley Bradley Park in Puyallup. And we are right near the South Hill Mall as um, Highway 512 uh, meets Meridian. So we're very close to lots of shopping, medical care. We have um, a really great medical system around us within just a few miles. Um, of course, Bradley Lake Park mm -hmm. is uh, right next door to us. And here at um, Bradley Lake, uh, we offer the, or here at Bradley Park, sorry, I have my head in the lake there. Um, we offer our uh, brownstone independent living. We have what we call the commons with catered living where we can cater to the needs that you might have specifically. We also have um, a memory care and uh, our community has some um, sought after openings right now. So if you would like to come and tour or uh, take a look at our community, give me a call and we'll show the information at the end. Um, we also have one other property, which is our um, 
flagship property in Des Moines. And I think on the line we have um, Elizabeth Milia here with us on the line. And um, so Elizabeth is at our Wesley um, Des Moines and they just opened their gardens building um, last August. And if, if um, you've ever been to their campus or know where their campus is, they have beautiful water views from a lot of their apartments. And um, so they offer independent cottages, brownstones uh, and uh, apartments. And then again, they have great water view apartments and they still have some available there on campus. So if um, you would like to take a look at Des Moines or um, get more information, definitely contact uh, Rob Lanouette or Elizabeth and they would be happy to provide you with further information. All right, I'll go, thanks Joan, I'll go ahead from here. So first of all, well, just a little bit of housekeeping and just some information. Um, you'll notice on your screen that there is a way that you can uh, chat with us and ask questions. You can also raise your hand if you want to ask questions. As David and Beth are talking, we're going to be monitoring questions that come up. So please feel free to put those in the chat box and we'll be sure to ask questions of them as we go through their presentation. So now I'd like to introduce our speakers. Uh, David Sturm is a realtor with Sturm Property Group and lives in the 55 plus community trilogy at Tahali. He applies his extensive career as, as a hospitality executive to achieve the highest level of guest service to every client. His strength is negotiating, his strength in negotiating is the key component to getting used to the best results in today's market. He is easy to get to know, fun to be around, and will work hard for you. David has your back and your best interests at heart. And then we, Beth Raman is here with us today. She is a realtor with EXP Realty and real estate investor with Raman Home Sales. She can provide anyone with a less stressful home sale. Having spent 15 years in law enforcement prior to starting her real estate career, Beth, Beth prides herself on going above and beyond for her clients. Beth is a CRES certified and specializes in helping seniors sell their homes and move into retirement communities. So without further ado, we'll get started and with Beth. Hang on. There we go. Okay. The slide, the slide will come up. There we go. <laughs> Hello. <laughs> Welcome everyone. Um, very happy to be here for you with you today. And so this is just an overview of the slide you're looking at, an overview of what I'm going to cover for you today. Um, statistics covering national and local statistics and kind of showing how they differ a little bit. We're going to start off talking about some mortgage rates and how that relates to the market and what's going on right now as well as talk about the median sales prices and the number of home sales nationally. And then I have a metro area breakdown that I just kind of highlight the top five um, areas and see where, where we in the Seattle Tacoma area kind of blend into that. And we're also gonna cover the, the local statistics covering the number of closed sales and the median prices and what we're seeing going on what the predictions are as well as what we've already seen. And we're into the third month already of this month um, or this year, sorry. <laughs> and it does feel like sometimes it's been one long month, but um, we'll also cover the average time on market and months of inventory, and then how those relate to what is going on in our market right now. And the next slide will show <laughs> what I'm going to conclude with, which is supply and demand, and basically covering the challenges for sellers and a little bit about how to navigate that, because I know David is going to talk a little bit about that as well. And then how these next three things, millennials, remote working, and suburban migration are really affecting our environment right now in real estate. So let's start off with mortgage rates, and this is not the correct slide. Um, so this, so, okay, I'll have to go through all the numbers. Um, what this slide was supposed to show is um, our mortgage rates and why I'm talking about mortgage rates or interest rates. I'll kind of use those um, back and forth. Um, 
mortgage rates really determine what a buyer's buying power is in the current market. So if you have a, a buyer that's looking at a $400,000 home, um, and that's what they've been pre-approved for. If that interest rate is at, say, like what we have on this slide, a 2.71, they're going to have more buying power than if that interest rate was, say, at like 3.4 or something like that. What this slide was supposed to show us is that right now what the predictions are um, is that we are going to be up to a 3.4% interest rate by the end of this year. I know there's a lot of media attention about mortgage rates and what they're going to be. I had one article recently, I think it was this Monday actually, that came through that said mortgage rate mortgage rates surge higher for the second week in a row. A surge in a mortgage uh, definition is going from a 2.81 to a 2.97. And as an example, uh, so if that $450,000 home is being purchased by someone, and this is assuming it's a 30-year conventional loan with 20% down, um, that 2.81% interest rate is going to be an $1,845 payment per month. So when that rate goes up to 2.97, that um, turns into an $1,876 a month payment. So it's only an increase of $31 a month, right? Not huge. When you're looking at a whole year, you know, you're talking about $360. Now, the difference, of course, between the 2.81 and going up to a 3.4, that pushes that payment up another $116. So that's where we might get start getting into some buyers not being able to afford as high of a purchase price on a home. And of course, that's very individual for their debt to income ratio and all that. And um, my disclaimer, of course, is that I am not a mortgage broker or loan officer of any kind. <laughs> I am a realtor. So um, that's why we have those professionals. And I work closely with them enough to know and see how when I'm working with buyers, how much this can affect my buyers and what they can afford to purchase. So what, um, okay, before, yeah, before we get to that, so what this did show is, so this first, this first blue line, the only one I think that all of you can see is in January of this year, we were at a uh, 2.71. At the end of February, it had already increased to a 2.81%. And, and these are averages. These numbers are taken from um, all of the 30-year conventional mortgage rates that are out there with the, I don't know how many major lenders, and, um, and then they average them. So it kind of gives us a good idea. What, um, what I found is that in October of 2020, 2022, the interest rates are still predicted to only be at about a 3.01, 3.02. So not a huge increase. And then going all the way up to December of 2023, um, several of the studies that I looked at are predicting that by then it's only going to be up to a 3.23. What I will say is that, of course, like all of you know, with predictions, there are, there's a wide range of them. One example of this is that uh, the chief economist for the National Realtors Association has stated that he thinks the interest rates are going to be up to that 3.4 by the end of this year, 2021. So that varies greatly from this study that, you know, and several others that gave like a three or five year prediction before we get up to that interest rate. I think a big driving factor in that is our COVID recovery and how long that's going to take because keeping the interest rates down helps stimulate the economy. So that's all I'm going to talk about mortgage rates. If anybody has any questions, of course, at any time, like Lisa said, throw it into the chat. Um, so now starting with national statistics. So home sales in general, and this is talking about the entire nation. So you're dealing with every, every state, every you know, rural to metropolitan. It doesn't just talk about the metropolitan areas. The predictions are that the median sales price are gonna go up 5.7% and the home sales numbers are actually gonna go up 7%. We're gonna dive into the local statistics shortly and that'll really show you how as most of you probably know, just from any kind of media attention, the um, Seattle-Tacoma area usually beats any kind of national statistics there are. And an article that I just read a couple of days ago, I think it was yesterday actually, um, 
might, some of you might have seen it, said that Washington State is one of the top um, real estate markets in the country right now. And I think we were rated fourth or fifth. And they were kind of in this article saying how shocking it was since Washington was kind of one of the first um, areas hit by COVID. So, and that this has been going on for the whole year of 2020 and into 2021. So we're very resilient. Uh, so those are the, the national statistics. Let's move on to the next slide. So this kind of covers, like I talked about before, um, the five top regions. And this was an interesting um, <clears throat> analysis of the metro areas. And it did cover like about the 50 or 55 top metro areas. Um, and you can see like San Jose, Sunnyvale, Santa Clara, they kind of clumped in uh, cities that are close together in those areas. Um, we came in fourth and the way I divided this and why I chose these five is because there were some, uh, like another area, Sacramento actually had uh, predicted 17.2% increase in the number of sales, but the prices weren't supposed to go up that much. So I kind of picked cities that are comparable to us with our increase. You can see we're fourth down there, Seattle, Tacoma, and they lumped in Bellevue. That was kind of random, I thought, but whatever, we like Bellevue. Um, so the 2021 sales number is predicted to go up 8.9%. So almost 9% more in the actual number of sales and then 9.7% increase in prices. And this is more along the lines of what we typically see um, and what we've seen in the past year. So the average for our area in um, price increases year over year has been about seven to 10%. So I think this is right on with 9.7%. And this is also what I'm actually seeing happening in the market right now. And I'll explain that in a little bit when we get into the local numbers. <clears throat> and I apologize. I have really bad allergies right now. So my voice is kind of scratchy. <laughs> um, we can go on to the next slide. All right. So here we are getting into the local market which is usually much more interesting for people to talk about. Um, I covered King, Pierce, Kitsap, and Thurston counties. Um, those are kind of the areas that I work in mostly. Um, I've had the random, you know, out in uh, Grays Harbor County and things like that, but these are the four major counties in our area to give a good um, idea of the statistics and what's going on. So this is covering the lighter blue color you can see is January of 2021 closed sales. And, and these are talking about residential sales. I'm not dealing with commercial um, or anything like that. The darker blue number is covering January of 2020 sales. So this is the information that I had when I put the slides together. Of course, now the February statistics just came out um, late last week, early this week. And what I noticed from analyzing those is that it's staying with the same range. So you can see here, King County had, you know, 1,526 closed sales in January of this year. And then that compares to 1,311 last year. Um, we had the same kind of range looking at just February. So, or just February stats, um, you know, almost what, a little over 200 more sales. Same thing with Pierce County. Of course, we have more sales this year than last year. And then Kitsap is a lot smaller of a, um, of a range, only an additional 30 sales. And then the, the oddball out was Thurston County where they actually had four fewer sales this year than last year. Um, and I have no reasons for that. I mean, some of this is gonna come into play with inventory and things that we'll talk about in a little bit, but um, that's just the numbers from January of uh, this year comparing to January of last year. So we're going in the right direction, more sales. And those are closed sales, not counting any of the active listing prices or um, units. So now talking about median price, <clears throat> this, um, this shows us that again, all the light blue lines are larger. So all of our pricings are going up. Um, and looking, this was most interesting looking at February statistics in comparison because seeing what has been going on in the market right now, which is um, a lot of bidding wars that are bidding up the pricing. And so bidding war is we have so little inventory and a lot of buyers wanting that same house. So we are getting multiple offers on those listings. 
and people are coming in and buyers are coming in and offering over listing price or they're using escalation addendums to push those prices up. So a home that's listed at, well, like this, the $700,000 might be selling for 750 or 760 or who knows what. We've seen even 100, $150,000 um, overages over the listing price because there's such a demand for houses. And so <clears throat> this is showing that in King County, the median sale price in January of 2021 was $725,000. Okay, obviously beating out January of 2020 um, at 630. But what I've already noticed is that the new statistics that just came out has that median price for February at 735. So we're already $10,000 higher than what happened a month ago. Um, it'll be interesting. I'll have to check with what March's stats are like when we come out in April. Um, <clears throat> And so the same thing, Pierce County has less of a, uh, of a division between those two, but we still we're at 380 up to 440. So $60,000 increase in a year of the purchase price in one year. And this is representing um, the, uh, a 12% increase. King County is a 16% increase just year over year, not even counting for that additional month that we already have in this one. And then Kitsap has a smaller gap again. Um, as they usually do, but still a 13% increase. And then Thurston County had their prices only go up by about $10,000 more in February, but overall it's like a 1.4% change. Okay, next slide. Okay, days on market and months of inventory. So this is where we really start seeing the difference and how um, the lack of inventory is affecting our market, which is, of course, causing those prices to rise. This days on market, unlike the median numbers that I used before, a median, as most people know, is um, half of the home sale prices are higher and half are lower when it's a median number. This is what we use as an average. So the days on market is taking all of um, the properties that are on the market and then figuring out what the average days that it took them to go from active until they went to pending. So after the inspection, if there are any inspections, <clears throat> it's not accounting for all the way to closing. So these numbers are skewed a little bit because with what I see in the market right now, um, like look at King County's, it says it's 30 days that it's taking um, a home to go from active to pending. That is actually not what we're seeing. When you use averages, this is like a little bit of background. When you use averages, you know, having a few homes that were overpriced or sat on the market for some time, like maybe for six or seven months, it can really kind of skew those numbers. So um, like with any statistics, you kind of have to take it with a grain of salt and figure out your own interpretation of it. But 30 days on market is not what we're actually seeing right now. We are getting those multiple offers and so what is the newer trend, it's been going on for probably a good six months or so, <clears throat> is that uh, listing brokers are using their review date. So when a seller signs the listing paperwork, they can choose two options, just accept offers as they come in, or you can have a specific review date. And so all the buying brokers know that their offers have to be turned in on that date to be reviewed that's where we get the multiple offers and it kind of helps control it for the seller a lot. Um, with that being said, what that's doing to our days on market is driving it down significantly, even more than the numbers you see here comparing to uh, January of 2020. You know, we're already at like about half of what a lot of these were. Um, because most of the homes are going pending after maybe five to 10 days, because they'll do a review date. They'll like list on a Thursday, do a review date that following Tuesday or Wednesday. And most of the purchases right now that I've been seeing are not having any kind of inspections. <clears throat> Sellers are either doing the inspections before and then expecting their buyers to waive the inspection. And that's again, back to we're having multiple offers, people walking with cash, no contingencies, so they can get that home because they're tired of making five and six offers. <clears throat> okay, so do we have any questions on that at all? 
no questions yet? I'm just rattling through stat statistics. So <clears throat> the next part of this is like, you'll notice the, the greenish color line, the really small one next to the dark blue that you can hardly see. <clears throat> this is months of inventory. So oh, this is the biggest problem, if you want to call it that. It's a, it's a pro and a con. <laughs> Um, that we have in the market right now. An average market is supposed to have five to six months of inventory, meaning that if <clears throat> no new homes were put on the market today, it would take five or six months for all of those homes to sell and be gone, like no more homes to purchase. Right now, as you can see from these numbers, we're at about two to three weeks compared to five or six months. That's huge. <clears throat> And that again is what's driving up all those prices because we have all the buyers that are looking to purchase those homes. We don't have enough homes on the market for all the buyers that we have out there ready and willing to buy. <clears throat> okay, we can move to the next slide now. <clears throat> oh, okay, go back. <laughs> so I'm missing a slide here. Um, so the last thing I wanted to cover is Supply and demand. <clears throat> I mentioned it a little bit before. So again, with this months of inventory, that is what is driving our supply and demand issues. <clears throat> the challenges for sellers is that they need to be ready to have this inundation of showings. So what I always suggest to my <clears throat> sellers, sorry, I'm losing my voice from my allergies. What I always suggest is that they are out of the home when it gets listed on the market. So what that means is that you make the arrangements and you move into Wesley Homes, whichever one of their beautiful communities works for you, and then list your home because you are going to be inundated with showings <clears throat> that we have a showing time system where we schedule all the showings right now because of COVID rules. And, um, <clears throat> and uh, they're booked solid. Most of these homes are booked solid for showings. <clears throat> so that is how to navigate as a seller. <clears throat> Sorry, I have to take myself off. I have to put myself on mute for a minute. Okay, we'll see how long this can last. <laughs> Sorry, it's, I don't know. My allergies have been so bad the last couple of days. Um, okay, so how to navigate. So that's basically just saying that you have to be ready and prepared for that inundation of showings and then make sure that the realtor or broker that you're working with knows to use that review date <clears throat> so that you can kind of have more um, control over the decision-making process. All right. And then <clears throat> other issues that we're having are not issues. It's just the, the way the market is right now with supply and demand is that our biggest buyers right now are millennials. <clears throat> the youngest millennials are 25 years old. So they're actually moving into purchasing in the market. <clears throat> and then we have uh, the older millennials that are turning 40 and they're usually um, buying up. So they've had a house already. They're selling it and they're moving into a bigger house or out of the area, whatever. And this kind of comes into play too with the remote working that we've seen going on with COVID-19. Um, a lot of employers have realized that remote working is not necessarily a bad thing and they're allowing their um, workers to stay on that remote status even after you know businesses are opening back up or will open back up. Eventually they will, right? <laughs> um, and so what that means is that these millennial buyers or just any buyers in general are realizing they're not necessarily tied to being close to work. You know, if they don't want to have a long commute, they've been kind of living in more urban type areas or just closer to wherever they work. So they're actually moving out. We're kind of calling this a suburban migration too, where they're leaving those more condensed areas like say Seattle and Although Tacoma is not a suburb of Seattle, but they're moving out. We've, I've seen a, an influx of buyers from Seattle. And what they're doing is they're selling their homes up there 
and then they have this chunk of cash. So they're coming down to our areas where their money will go further. And, um, and then they're able to, to beat out our first time home buyers because they've got cash from that sale. So that's kind of hurting the, the supply and demand <clears throat> or focusing the supply and demand issues, I guess. So um, in conclusion, I think it's a fabulous time to sell. It's also a good time to buy, but it's just, it's more challenging and you have to be ready for the challenges of buying, making multiple offers and maybe not getting the first home that you look at. But it's a great time to be a seller. <clears throat> Homes are selling quickly and usually for more than whatever the asking price is, even if the broker you're working with has priced it according to recent sales, you still have those buyers coming in and fighting over it. Um, <clears throat> and all the predictions I've examined and stats from so far this year indicate it's going to continue to be a great time to sell. <clears throat> Throughout this whole year, we are expected. Some of the predictions anyway, were that it's going to <clears throat> slow down, kind of return to a more normal schedule of um, sales, which is usually after Labor Day, it slows down. <clears throat> I'll wait to prove myself correct, but I don't think that's going to happen because we just have such a low inventory still and it's not going to change anytime soon that I think we're, we're going to have a market in um, September and October like we did this last year during COVID in 2020 that it was just, it was, it was like a spring market still. So that's all good for being a seller. Um, if you have a good realtor or real estate broker that's working for you, then you should have a great home sale experience. <clears throat> that is all I have to say. <laughs> Beth, thank you. Um, oh, that, was, that was rough. Um, <laughs> you, you know, I feel for you because my allergies will probably start doing the same thing, but in about a month. So um, if anybody has any questions for Beth, we can give her a chance to um, get some water and we can talk more after David's presentation as well. So thanks, Beth, for getting through that. Um, appreciate it. And let's go ahead and move on and talk about the home selling process with David. Very good. Yeah, so thanks so much, uh, Lisa. I appreciate the opportunity to talk to everyone. Um, one of the most important things about the home selling process is just you know, managing expectation, knowing what the process is. You may not have sold your house in 10, 15, 20 years. Uh, lots change, but lots is remain the same too. So I just want to go through the home selling process here, and then we'll come back and spend a little bit more time on number two, which is preparing your home for sale. There's a lot of uh, misconceptions of what you need to do to actually make your home presentable and, and put it on the market, whether it's in Seattle or anywhere uh, that you live. So uh, I appreciate the, this opportunity. The first thing, you know, that, that we recommend is you reach out to a uh, some professionals. You know, reach out to your uh, real estate agent, uh, reach out to your um, your CPA, make sure you have all your ducks in a row of how you're going to go about this process and put a plan together. And um, uh, I'll go through this step-by-step -step plan and, you know, it can be done in two days, but it can be done in a month too. You'd rather do it in a step-by-step -step process uh, than trying to rush through this. So when you're considering your home for sale, you just really want to... Uh, Sit down first, take a deep breath, put a plan together. Uh, preparing your home for sale. Uh, we'll go through that. Uh, we'll, we can go back to that in a second. Um, uh, and then once you uh, prepare your home for sale, you're going to put it on the market. And, um, uh, you know, if, if homes aren't selling, to best point, you know, uh, the inventory is so low. Uh, but there are some homes that are skewing the numbers <clears throat> uh, that are being on the market way longer than uh, they should. And I always advise my clients, go check all the houses that have been on the market over a week to 10 days and find out what they did wrong. Because all that has to do with the condition of the home and pricing. Um, and then you want a real estate agent that's going to negotiate your offer. Um, you know, one of the, one of the um, <clears throat> tendencies these days is to do discount brokers, you know, uh, online brokers, you know, sell your house for, you know, um, yourself or for very little commission or very little cost. And we always just, uh, that works for some people, but uh, one of the areas where it comes in most critical is the negotiating process. Um, you know, a lot of times you get what you pay for. So be careful with that. Uh, online estimates are, are, are not um, 
uh, as accurate as you may think uh, they are, because uh, how can somebody know the, 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 what the value of your home if they've never been inside of it? And they don't know the story of your house and how much you put into that house. So, um, you know, a local agent's going to help you with that. Um, and then um, uh, after negotiating, then you're going to close and collect. It does take about right now from uh, um, what we're seeing, you know, a 30 day close period from is, is usually what you're going to get once you get your offer to when you close. But um, for listing your home, just add another week on that. I mean, you list it on Thursday, uh, you, you get your offers through the weekend, you do a uh, review offers on Tuesday, and you know, you're signing papers by Wednesday, Thursday, depending on whether or not you go back and forth. So it's a very, if it's priced right, and the condition of the home is where it needs to be, it's going to sell. And that's the time frame you should expect. Uh, and then there's appraisal, or no, I'm sorry, then um, there's uh, the inspection that takes place after negotiating the offer um, that a lot of people are waiving. We never recommend it, but you can expect uh, maybe a, a pre-inspection that may happen. You may want to inspect your home um, uh, prior uh, to putting it on market so you can present that to your, your buyers and say, hey, here's my inspection. Here, I fixed everything and you know, uh, allow them to make a decision off that. Uh, or you can allow the buyer to pre-inspect the home themselves. Uh, but uh, And then, uh, of course, after you, you get contract, there may be an inspection after the contract. So it's one of those three uh, that usually takes place. Even if you've done your own contract, your own inspection, people may want to do their own. Um, uh, the next one is the appraisal, which is always the, you know, we as uh, agents, you know, um, it's a love-hate relationship with appraisers. Uh, they're meant to really keep an eye on things to make things sure things don't get out of hand. And they really represent the, the lender. So they're going in there doing their fiduciary responsibility as an independent third party to appraise your house, to see it with what, what uh, the fair market value of the house is and that, uh, that the bank isn't overpaying, uh, but, but also that the buyer is not overpaying. So uh, the appraisal process takes uh, about a week or two, uh, actually longer than that, two to three weeks after um, uh, mutual acceptance. But it is an important feature that we need to make sure you're aware of. Um, a lot of uh, folks are waiving, uh, waiving their inspection, but you cannot waive the appraisal uh, unless you have cash. Um, and, then, um, um, and then you close. Uh, so that takes about 30 days. So now we can go to the next slide to go through, you know, uh, a guide that we put together, uh, and I can provide this to anybody that's on the call, um, our 30 day guide for, for preparing your home to sale. And it's really meant to sell it fast. Um, there's a lot to do when you think about selling a house. You, you've created a lot of memories there. There's been a lot of um, um, uh, love you put in your house and uh, it's not simple. So simple as just putting a, a for sale sign in your front yard. <clears throat> you got to think about it and uh, <clears throat> making this a, a process rather than a rush uh, is going to make this uh, selling your house a stress-free process. Uh, uh, as stress-free as it can be process, but there's a lot to do. So I want to go through those and kind of just kind of chunk it down a little bit, spend a little bit of time on each one of these points and, you know, frame it by saying, you know, it's important that your house be in the right condition. There's only two reasons why a home stays on the market longer than seven to 10 days. It's either not priced right or it's not in the right condition. So you want to make sure your home is in the right condition. And there's a lot of little things you can do but you don't need to do big things uh, unless you have to. You know, if you need to put a new roof on it, uh, that kind of thing, but you don't need to. Uh, that can all be done through uh, another process, uh, through the negotiation process. But you know, a lot of people ask me about landscaping and we'll kind of get to that, but you, know, you don't need to re-landscape your whole place. You don't need to remodel your kitchen. Um, you know, there's just a lot of little things you can do to prepare your home to sell. The first one is just prep your pa paperwork. Just getting all of the information, if you've got an HOA, uh, if you've got um, um, uh, permits, maybe you've done some remodeling, we'll make sure you have your permits uh, in hand. Um, if you have a renter in there, uh, you wanna make sure that's that's all in line. But um, you know, uh, buyers are gonna wanna, lo wanna know a lot about your house, a lot of it they can find online, but um, you wanna make sure you have all your ducks in a row and paperwork. Some obvious things, 
in the first week, make a make an extra set of keys. Uh, you're going to have people um, going through a secure lockbox uh, on your door that your agent will put on to make sure that no one gets in your house without being um, uh, 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 certified to or allowed to. Uh, everybody that comes through that needs to have a real estate license uh, that uses the box. So it's a very secure um, a process of getting in your house. But they need a set of keys that you put in the box so that they'll be electronically open and get in and it records who was in there, it records how long they were in there. So it's very, very secure and a very important process, but you gotta make the extra keys for it. Um, then get your, your boxes and duct tape and start packing things up. Um, when we talk to our clients and walk through their house, uh, you know, you probably heard this uh, term a lot where you declutter and you um, uh, downsize, you know, well, you need to start that process right away as soon as you think you're gonna sell a house, walk through your house, Make sure you have all the packing materials and duct tape because you actually are going to start packing. Uh, you're just not going to pack everything. You're just going to start packing uh, what you need to, to get get things um, get things going. Should do some simple things like changing light bulbs, updating light fixtures, um, little things like that. Every little thing uh, you only get a, uh, uh, one chance to make a, a good first impression. So um, all those little things make uh, sense. You know, you got to scour the, the, the bathroom, uh, take uh, any personal items, you know, out of the, uh, you know, around your house, but more importantly in your bathroom, no one wants to see your head and shoulders. Um, uh, so, you know, visit uh, Target or uh, Home Goods and get some updated little knickknacks for the countertop for um, towel holders and uh, uh, tissue holders. So everything looks professional and neat. Uh, we even have designers that can come in and stagers that can come in and help you with, you know, if, if, if like, like Beth said, if you've moved out of the house, we can stage it for you. But at the same time, if you're, if you're gonna be in the house, you wanna make sure that it's uh, clean and ready to go. Uh, you know, sprucing up uh, the kitchen as, as well is, uh, is an important step, just putting things away. People are gonna open up your closets and your bedroom. They are gonna open up your closets and the kitchen. So you wanna make sure everything looks neat and where it needs to be. Because if you're not moving out before you sell your home, you need to give the uh, the potential buyer the expectation that there's plenty of room in this house. That everything isn't shoved in all the closets and all the cabinets. They can look and see that, oh, there's plenty of room in here. So uh, little things like that go a long way. Uh, the next uh, week two, um, just again, the same kind of philosophy is living up uh, uh, your living room. Um, uh, you know, maybe invest in a few th throw, pill throw pillows, um, bringing the room together with a rug or anything else that's missing, hide magazines, any clutter, any personal items uh, you want to get out, um, 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 uh, out of the way and just tuck things away, to, uh, uh, wires away, stereo speakers and things like that. Um, and then making sure your dining room looks like a place where someone might actually like to eat. Um, uh, is that what we tell our, our, our folks? Sometimes with uh, COVID, uh, it becomes a workstation. It becomes you know the community uh, catch-all for everything. So you just want to make sure the dining room looks looks uh, fantastic uh, as well. And then um, you know you need to make a decision if you're going to store, donate, or throw away. I mean there are companies that will come in and they will auction off what you have in your house. Uh, there's a lot of other businesses that will take your um, take your donations and they'll actually come to your house and, and pick it up. So sometimes you've been in your house for, for a long time, you're gonna make a, a, a tough decision here on what you're gonna donate, what you're gonna throw away, what you're gonna take with you. Uh, and sometimes that takes some time. So you wanna spend uh, some time really thinking through that. Uh, hire at week three, this is where you, you want your local agent um, kind of putting everything together, uh, making sure all your paperwork's together, uh, you've had some pricing strategies. You've had some um, uh, talk about timelines. Um, you know, local agents are going to know what's selling and what's not in your neighborhood, uh, and how to properly price uh, your home uh, to sell. And uh, they're going to help you through that because they got an in-depth knowledge of what it's like in that neighborhood. Um, uh, you know, they'll look at the uh, the average days of market, they look at what's selling, but also most importantly, they know the local agents that are working that area. 
and have a working relationship with them and can get deals done by understanding, you know, how to work with those local agents. They understand, you know, um, what features are most important and, you know, is it the yard? Is it the patio? Is it a deck? Is it a five piece bath? What is it? Is it the, you know, the, the office? Is it a first floor you know, um, suite? They're going to know all these little nuances of what that community finds most important. And they have their finger on the pulse uh, of the market. Um, so you're going to get the, the best price and they're going to make sure they protect your equity as well. So um, uh, that's uh, that's important process to go through. So at that point, you're either um, repainting or touching up your walls, uh, making a list of small repairs. Uh, if uh, you've got a pre-inspection, that's all going to be revealed. But it's better to get out in front of some of these things, or at least understand that it is going to be brought up. Um, you know, you you really can't hide anything uh, in, in uh, um, uh, from. Uh, potential buyers uh, because they're going to get an inspection or they're going to, you know, look themselves. A quality agent is going to make sure that they, uh, they um, uh, make sure they uh, um, go through the entire house, you know, top to bottom and another set of eyes looking at it. So the better just, just be upfront with, uh, with folks. We can always tell how well a buyer is going to, or how well a seller is going to be to work with when we see how well their house is kept. And, um, whether or not they've, they've done all the pre-work, uh, they've disclosed everything on their disclosure statements, um, they've allowed a pre-inspection, they've done a pre-inspection. If their agent has put up all the, the necessary addendum, all makes a, a really important uh, first impression for an agent. Um, and add curb appeal. So just, you know, doing the curb appeal is just cutting the lawn. It's just, you know, getting weeds out of there, raking. Um, you know, there's no reason to redesign your yard because uh, you're selling it and somebody else coming in and buying it is going to go, no, I'm just going to do my own thing. They just want to see a clean palette. They want to feel good about walking into your house and really keep that um, in mind because as people walk up to the front door, you remember I told you they're going to be, the agent's going to be using their, um, a, uh, a device to get into your house to get into a lockbox. And that takes about 30 seconds to a minute for the agent to do. And while your, your buyers are standing there, they're standing at your front door, just looking closely at your front door, just looking at your landscaping and get a feel for the house before they even walk into it. So that is probably the most critical part is your entryway, your front door. Um, uh, uh, again, first impressions. Um, and then, um, then we're gonna get into uh, uh, doing some, th those little repairs that are, that are um, that you've noted, um, you know, just fixing all the little things around the house, you know, getting your windows clean and um, and that kind of thing is is important. But you, you can also hire somebody to do it too. So we have cleaners that we can come in and, and clean up your house, make sure it's it's uh, it's tidy and it's uh, everything's where it needs to be. Uh, and uh, you know, we have landscapers who can come in and just freshen the place up. And uh, you know, um, uh, doing that final clean is is important, and uh, making plans for your your dog, your pet, your hedgehog, whatever it is. Uh, the last thing that a buyer wants to hear when he opens up the door is a dog barking in the garage. Uh, so you want to make pl plans for that, um, uh, and not have that uh, being an issue. And good lord, having the dog get out or having the cat get out, or or you know. Obviously, you don't want a ferret running around the house. Um, so, uh, and the last time is that you know making last last week. Think about how you're going to make the house smell. I mean, when guests come in, if you you know if you can have cookies baking in the oven, that's great. Uh, you just want to make sure everything's clean. You don't want to over deodorize. You don't want to over um, uh, do this part of it because it can be very very uh, off putting if it's if there's too much of a uh, chemical smell smell when a, when a buyer walks into a house. So um, get quality photos, you know, uh, uh, agents uh, uh, that are on their game are gonna get those photos done for you. They're gonna get professional photos done. They're gonna get drone footage. They're gonna do all the things that need to be done to market your own, uh, including videos and, um, and so forth. Um, and then we talked about getting the home, uh, a pre-listing inspection if you needed to. And, um, 
giving your house just a once over. You're, 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 you're ready to go. Um, uh, you, you, you know, you are moving out of the house. It's probably gonna look better than it's ever looked in a long time, but you are gonna get uh, a lot out of, out of all this process. But my point of bringing it up and talking about it this way is that it does simplify the process. You gotta determine what you're gonna do with a local agent. Even if you had an agent that helped you buy a house in one part of a city, you may not wanna use that agent for another part of the city. We always refer our clients. If I'm not, I'm the, I'm the expert here in Bonnie Lake and Puyallup. If I have a client that's going to Issaquah or um, New. Castle, I'm going to refer them up because I'm going to go find the agent that's local there that can take them uh, and make sure they get well taken care of. Um, there's one last thing on the last page. I just, if we do want to drive this point home further, but Beth was saying about supply and demand and um, sale of home prices uh, just going up much better, than, more than a national average. And the other cities that she mentioned too, are the same way. And I just wanted to say one last thing about this is that you know, there's there's the Pacific Northwest. I was just talking to a client on the phone today, and he's like, "What? You know, why is the market so crazy up in Seattle?" And he's coming up from from California. Uh, no, yeah, California. And he, you know, as an idea, because California's going to do the same thing. But I said, "You know what? We love our trees up here. You know, our urban boundaries have been set for the last seven years, and they're not going to come up to be reviewed in, until another two years. So the urban boundary is what." Uh, the state uses to determine where you can build houses where you can't. And they're simply not going to expand those urban boundaries. That The market has to figure out how to do more with less. And um, there's no end in sight then for the people who own to get top dollar for their property because the competition is going to be so small. And this is probably true in most major markets where you know inventory continues to go up and uh, home prices continue to go right along with it. It's just... Uh, it's just no end in sight. So the opportunity to really put together a great plan to sell your house uh, is, is uh, it just takes a good local agent. So thank you so much. That's, uh, that's all I had. Appreciate the opportunity to talk to everybody. Great, thanks, David. Um, it's really good information. Um, uh, Brent, can you get everybody back up on the screen? And we do have some questions that came in. So I'll, I'll go over those. Um, one of them, and I, I, David, I think you touched on this a little bit. Um, is is staging necessary anymore? What about staging, and is that necessary? Uh, I would always say that if your house, if you look at all the statistics, will sell for a higher price if it's staged. Now, there's different forms of staging. You have light staging, you know, where just the, you know, the kitchen area, the dining room, and the master, you know, a bathroom or two, and then light staging maybe in the in the uh, um, the other rooms may suffice, but I always recommend staging. Um, walking into an empty house gives the buyer just, it doesn't give them a homey feeling at all. So um, uh, I would suggest we, we stage. Okay, thanks. Can I, can I add to that, Lisa? Yes, ma'am. Um, I would like to add that um, I work with a lot of senior sellers that don't have the funds to pay for the cost of staging. And because it's, not necessarily inexpensive. And so what I always do going the extra mile, and I would hope everybody would have their realtor or real estate broker do the same, is to do digital staging. Because I think the most important thing is to get people into the house. Uh, like David said, it's, it's hard when you walk into a house that's completely vacant because it's echoey. But if you have digitally staged online, then at least they have that idea and they can see the flyer and say, oh yeah, see, this is how big the couch is that'll fit there. Because that's what they're really trying to do is to make it cozier, but also know that their furniture will fit in that house. That's what helps with the staging. So that's my tip. I didn't know about digital staging. Thanks for that. Yeah. Okay. Um, and let's see, I think both of you kind of touched on this a little bit. What is a reasonable time frame from listing to closing? And I think that that question was probably answered pretty well. Yeah, my numbers were not to closing. So what um, cash buyers are coming in and making offers that have a 10 day closing, like literally, so you, you, you list the home and you're done. That home is sold and you're out of that house in, you know, 10 or 14 days. Um, 
this is always a conversation when I'm working with buyers that I have with the listing broker to find out what the sellers are looking for. Because the most recent one that, we, that I made an offer on with a couple of buyers that are looking in Seattle, um, that wasn't important to the sellers. So we did a normal traditional 30 days. They actually wanted a, a more traditional 30 day closing because they needed to get their furniture moved out. Even though it was like all staged and everything in there, they needed that time to you know get what was theirs and then have the stager take their things. So um, there's a wide range, but it just, it comes down to a conversation between the brokers. Right. Um, and another one, will lenders finance homes over appraised value? Who wants to tackle that one? Uh, do ahead. you want to, David? No, go ahead. Oh, okay. Yeah, no, they won't. Lenders, that's the whole purpose of an appraisal is to confirm to the lender that they're not lending more money than the home is worth. So if an appraisal comes in at less than whatever the purchase price is, um, then there are a couple of options. You know, the seller can reduce the price to, to meet whatever that appraisal price is, or the buyer can bring cash to the table, as we say, and, and close that gap. Um, yeah. And, and appraisals are not necessary with cash offers. Not necessary. They're not done at all. Did that answer the question? I think so. Yep. Thank you. Okay, well this, um, let's see. This is a very, okay, this is interesting. This is a very strong earthquake area. Why is this not a requirement for selling to know it is earthquake safe? Okay. Well, we do have a requirement that water heaters are earthquake strapped. So <laughs> we don't make the, David and I don't make the rules. Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah. I've seen it more and more where with uh, like flipped homes, I was just looking at one the other day and that was one of the selling features that they had listed in there that everything has been retrofitted for earthquake safety. Okay. Um, let's see, what else? Oh. It, the next one is, is it, necessary to paint all your, your all of your walls white no not necessarily no um an off light what you want to avoid are the, the the kids bedrooms that are red and blue um you know anything else any other neutral color is fine but no you do not have to do all white all right anybody else have any other questions I think we got everybody's everybody's questions answered. Just do you want to? Can I comment? I think I saw a, a note early on. It's more of a comment that um, she finds it frustrating that the seller does not have an inspection done so that the decision can be oh. made as to know if the house is worth buying. Oh, thanks, um, Beth. Yeah. Yeah, and I've just I just wanted to comment on that because um because I. I go wherever my clients need me. So I'm helping buyers right now that are looking in Seattle, anywhere in Seattle with a view. So I've, I've seen a wide range of places and Bainbridge Island and Mercer Island. And, and then I also work with a lot of sellers in um, Pierce County. That's where my home office is. And so what I have noticed is this trend that's in Seattle that'll get down here eventually of the sellers are doing inspections, a seller procured inspection before listing it on the market. They're doing this to kind of encourage the buyers to waive their inspection. Um, there are varying opinions on this and obviously two different sides of the, um, the issue, but the Washington Realtors Association hotline attorney <laughs> highly recommends against both of those. Like the seller, the dangers with a seller procured inspection is that once you know something is wrong with the house, you have to disclose it. So, I mean, it, you don't have to necessarily fix it, but it's something that has to be disclosed. And, you know, usually we know things that are wrong with our homes, but things can pop up that you had no idea about. Um, and then with um, the buying side of it, 
you know, going off of a seller procured inspection, and it should be a third party inspector, but it's not like appraisers where it really is, you know, an unknown entity. This is someone that the, the buyer called up or the seller called up and said, please come inspect my house because I'm going to list it. I think we can trust those comments in there, but it's not someone that you are hiring yourself to say, oh, I want to know what this is and what that is and, you know, every detail of the home. You, don't, you weren't there for the inspection. So it can be dangerous from both sides. But I would never recommend any buyer buying a house without doing an inspection. That's crazy. <laughs> <laughs> good, good advice. <laughs> Can you second that that statement, David? <laughs> Absolutely. I mean, you're spending, you know, half a million dollars more for you know, probably the most important financial decision of your life. You, you kind of want to make sure you're, you're getting what you're paying for. Mm -hmm. All right. Um. Okay, I think we got all the questions covered unless anybody else has anything else they'd like to ask. We'd be happy to ask our experts. Otherwise, I'm gonna, let's see, we've got Beth and David's contact information up here. This presentation will be available um, following uh, within 24 hours after this, after this webinar. So that'll be available to you. Um, and we'll be sure to send out those links afterwards to everybody that attended. Um, and I'm going to put up the phone numbers for our campuses here in Tahale at Bradley Park in Puyallup, uh, Wesley Des Moines, and Wesley Lee Hill. Um, we'd welcome your visits to any of our campuses. We are doing uh, private tours. Um, our campuses are all, um, all of our residents in our campuses as well as the majority of our employees have all received their COVID vaccines. So we are able to open up our campuses more. Um, so it's, it's a great day. Um, vaccine days were like parties at the campuses. It was quite fun. Um, anyway, so if any of you would like to get in touch with any one of us, those are the phone numbers there. Uh, we certainly appreciate you attending today and look forward to having you join us at our next event. And with that, I'll go ahead and sign off unless there's any other questions. Again, thank you for attending. David, Beth, thank you very much for participating. And everybody take care. Yeah. Thank you, thank you very much, Beth and David.